Jennifer Mata and a broader group of TLU students. We have Israel, Mia, Caitlin, Kevin, and Leslie. We're looking to work with Jane Friedman and Backpack Ministry. Yay. Anyone else? I've asked Lucretia Burton this morning to open our meeting with a prayer. This summer, Terry and I were at a crossroads, and I was praying for guidance. And this is what the Lord gave me. Where were we when the Indians were being killed and their lands being stolen, and God's people remained silent? Where were we when slaves were brought to the United States, sold, families separated, and were mistreated in unimaginable ways, and God's people remained silent? Where were we when Irish Catholics were refused jobs, asked to leave our country and discriminated against, and God's people remained silent? Where were we during the Holocaust when many families were separated and millions of people were murdered, and God's people remained silent. Where were we during World War II when Japanese families were separated, their goods and houses stolen, and they were interred in prison camps, and God's people remained silent? Where were we during the Civil Rights Movement when people were imprisoned, injured, and killed because they wanted to peacefully point out the discrimination of our nation, and God's people remained silent. Where were we when Herod killed the children, two years old and younger, and Jesus' family had to flee to another country, and God's people remained silent? Where were we when Christ was crucified, and God's people remained silent, or cried, crucify him, crucify him? Dear God, are you giving us another chance to show that we are your people? We thank you that we are one of the richest nations in the world. We have more than enough. Our storage units, which are larger and safer from the elements than the houses of these immigrants, are filled with our overflow. Help us to be generous. Forgive us for separating families, putting children in cages, discriminating out of fear, ignoring pleas for asylum from those in fear of death, and allowing deaths to happen when we don't speak out. Help us to live so you will say to us, as is in Matthew 25, then the king will say to those on his right, come, take your inheritance, for I was a stranger and you invited me in. Help us to seek and do your will. Amen. 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 Will God's people again remain silent? No. We're very grateful to have Lucretia and Terry on our organizing board. I'm Mary Grace Kedner. I'm co-chair of Interfaith Welcome Coalition, and Linda Baxter and I are the ones responsible for hurting these cats, so <laughs> be, be kind to us. <laughs> Our special guest speaker this morning, um, Terry, would you like to introduce Mariela? We've made two very special friends at the bus station, and the honor today that both of them are going to be speaking to us, Mariello Asso and Primitivo Torres. You, you, you heard him speak just a second ago. Um, while we're handing out backpacks, they are very much involved in teaching people that are, are bus immigrants, migrants, about their, their legal rights and the things that they should know. So we're very honored to have both of them come 
speak with us this morning. They're very dear friends of ours. Thank you. Thank you. Station project manager at RAICES, um, and we'll be talking more in depth about what the project is about and what we've been doing since um, May of 2018. Good morning, everyone. My name is Primitivo Torre. I introduced myself already. I'm very honored to be here as well. All right, so for those that aren't familiar with what our project is about, um, as Terry mentioned, um, we are at the Greyhound bus station and we're meeting all of the families and individuals that are being released from detention centers as well as the Customs and Border Protection facilities down at the borders. We know that San Antonio is a huge release point for a lot of families and individuals that are being released from detention and it's also a major transfer point for families and individuals heading to other parts of the United States. Um, so since the beginning of our project in May, we have provided legal orientations to close to 5,000 families. That's um, around 5,000 adults and more than 6,000 children. Um, what we've identified as our, uh, the main objectives of our project is that we want to provide legal orientations to every single family and individual that goes to the bus station so that they know what the next steps are towards obtaining asylum. So the legal orientation that we cover has two parts. The first is an intake that we use to collect data that we hope to use for advocacy purposes. And the paperwork orientation that we go over um, covers information about their ICE check-in, instructions about applying for asylum, so the one-year deadline to submit an asylum application, how to find out about their court dates. Um, and we also have a Know Your Rights component that is super important because we do hear a lot of the times from families um, that ICE officials or CBP officials are telling them that they have no rights in this country, that their children cannot be enrolled in school because that's against the law. And we want to dismantle those lies because we want to make sure that all these families know that they do have rights in this country. Um, and so another part of the work that we're doing is that we're providing legal resources for whatever state or major city they're going to. Admittedly, our legal resources need some work, um, but we are in the process of updating those right now so that we make sure that they are in a good shape and that when a family reaches out to one of those organizations on the list, that they can um, reach someone that can provide support to them. We want our work um, to extend beyond what we're doing here in San Antonio because we realize that it's very important that they're aware of what the next steps are towards obtaining asylum. But we also know that they're going to need support in going through those steps. So um, we really want to make sure that we're connecting them to organizations in their sponsor cities and states so that they have support. Um, and then a couple of other objectives of our, of our project are that we make sure that the injustices that go on in detention centers do not go unheard. We hear a lot of terrible things about these spaces, and so right now we're in the process of working with our litigation team at RAICES to, um, to use the data that we've collected all these months um, for advocating purposes. And then lastly, um, one very, very important objective is that we become symbols of support. We know that when these families and individuals arrive to the country, they receive a very harsh welcome. And so it's very important for us to be at the bus station and to collaborate with the Interfaith Welcome Coalition um, to provide a warm welcome, to make them feel supported, and to let them know that even though ICE officials and CBP officials can try to rob them of their dignity, no one can take away the strength and the courage that they possess because we know that they don't make this trek just for the hell of it. Um, and so um, we want to make sure that we're there to support them. Um, just, I'm going to let you know just a little bit about myself before I started this. I actually was at the detention center for the last year so we worked at various detention centers, but I was at Carnes 
I'll say like the last seven, eight months. And we were there since day one for the zero tolerance policy. So we saw it all, we heard it all, we breathed it. And unfortunately, our, our government right now, it's causing a disservice to a lot of these people. And it, it trickles down to a lot of the ICE agents and they treat people with such cruelty and inhumane. And we're there for support as well, not just legal resources, but support. Uh, we have a lot of dads who unfortunately try to commit suicide where we're there. Uh, we have children as young as four months be there with us. So uh, it is very discouraging to see all this, but we're there trying to help. And now working at the bus station and seeing the collaboration between Raices and IWC, it gives us such hope. And also at the same time, the welcoming is so important, not just the legal aspect of it. And, and IWC gives so much backpacks, food, water, but just the welcoming part is so important for these families to know that they are welcome in this country and that they are loved. So where do we see most people that are coming from? We see the triangle basically, which is Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador. We have 29% of people come from Guatemala, 52% of people are coming from Honduras, and 12% coming from El Salvador. There's a smaller percentage coming from Nicaragua, other countries, and also southern Mexico. We also see that as well. Um, we know that um, 98% uh, of the femicide cases go unprosecuted in these countries. Um, and unfortunately, we have a poverty rate of close to 60% in these countries. So, like Mariela said, they make the trek here, not they want to, it's out of necessity, out of persecution. So it is very important, the work that we do, to welcome them as well. So after um, analyzing some of the data that we're, we have collected since May, um, we have found that um, on average, people are spending two days in the Yelera, um, with the highest number of days that someone has reported being 16. And um, uh, For those who know, the Yelera is a freezer, it's like right. a freezer box, and they give them only an aluminum, aluminum blanket. And sometimes they go out without water for days, they give juice, mm -hmm. certain things. And when all these kids come out sick out of that, most of the kids come out very, very sick. Right, so. yeah, they have very inhuman conditions. And so to think that someone has spent 16 days in a facility like that is horrifying. For the Ferrera, we have... You can't hear me, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so on average, they are spending two days in the Yelera, and the highest number of days that anyone has reported being detained in, in the Yelera was 16 days. For the Perrera, mm -hmm. for the Perrera, so on average they have spent three days there, with the highest number of days being 15. And, and the Perrera is like, it's like a bullpen, mm -hmm. but uh, the freezer, the Yelera, they have, they sleep on the floor, basically, just cement floor, that, that's where they sleep. Mm -hmm. And then for detention centers, we found that they are spending on average 17 days, with the highest number of days being 268. So this was from an individual that was released from adult detention that had been detained for this long. And um, was this recent? I mean, like in the last year? In the last year, yes. So all of this information that we're reporting on is information that was collected since May of 2018 until now. Yes. Just a clarifier. Yes. Atlanta and the Pereira, those are on the border. Those yes. are on the border. The detention facilities you're referring to is Dillian Carnes. Dillian Carnes and Pearsall, which Pearsall. are the major ones here um, around San Antonio. But Pearsall, the, the length of stay is much longer, isn't it? Isn't that sort of a different level of case? Yes, and so Pearsall is for adult, um, adult detainees. Yes. And so um, whereas in family detention, the Flores settlement sort of determines that they cannot be there for more than 20 days. There's nothing like that for adults. And for the zero tolerance policy, as we all know it, we had families that went there for seven, eight months mm -hmm. for the zero tolerance policy. And these guys were babies. They grew up basically in detention, incarcerated. Right. We also found that um, ICE check-ins are scheduled within nine days of their release, but we have found that sometimes they are scheduled on the same day of their release. So these are mistakes that ICE makes but have serious implications on these cases. I was just on a call yesterday with people in Tennessee. Um, there was a woman that was released um, from, I believe, Dilly, and her ICE check-in was scheduled on the same day of her release.
experience, which makes absolutely no sense. And so, of course, she missed her ICE check-in, and she showed up as soon as she could, but was detained again. And so these are mistakes that ICE is making, but have really negative implications on, on these cases. And so what we're doing is trying to identify as many of those as we can and to be able to, to be there to support these, these people. Um, we've also identified more than 900 cases of family separations in the Yoleras and Perreras. Um, and these are, they can vary from a couple of hours to days, but we know that it's still unjust. So the justification that CBP officials say or have for um, separating people in these facilities is that if the child is older than eight or older than 10, that they have to be separated from the parent. But we know that this doesn't always happen. We know that it's very randomized and we know that it shouldn't be happening because it has serious psychological implications on the well-being of these children and their parents. And then um, we've also found 180 cases of port of entry denial, so people showing up to an official port of entry and being turned away and having no choice but to cross through the river, which is a huge risk for their safety. And then additionally, we have documented many, many mistakes on their release documents. So lately, um, I just mentioned the mistakes that they make in regards to their ICE check-ins, but what we're seeing is that they're also um, making mistakes on the notice to appear documents, which Primitivo well can tell you more about. Uh, so what's going on lately is that they're giving them notice to appear, and what's happening is they're giving notice to appear here in Texas, even though they're moving to New York, California, and everywhere else. And, these, and there's a lot of confusion right now with a lot of the judges, ICE themselves, and also with the families. Do I have to go back to Texas to, to go to court? So a litigation team is on it and trying to figure out what's going on ICE, we figure they're doing it deliberately, not just to cause confusion, but at the same time, if people don't show up to, this, to their court hearings, automatically they get what's called a default judgment against them. So they can go back to the detention center and be on deportation very, very quickly. So when they say do it the right way, well, let me just kind of explain that, just give me a sense. We have people in Tijuana right now on the other side. We have 10,000 people we're trying to apply for asylum, yet they're only allowing 27 to 30 people per day, per day. So the other 10,000 are susceptible to kidnap, susceptible to harm, and that's what's going on right now. It is very deliberate what they're doing. The zero tolerance response will be very deliberate to cause harm to these children to deter other families from coming. Virtually people have a need to come, they are going to come to seek shelter and to have a better life for their families. So we are, we're looking at destinations, where are they going? Uh, we notice there are the most states, we, we basically, this is out of four, over 4,800 families that we saw since May. And the top five states where they're going is Texas, which is number one, then it's California, Florida, Louisiana, and Maryland. Um, and according to the 2016 American Immigration Council, it can be harder to find a lawyer depending on where you live. It is very, especially in the rural areas. And a lot of these families, without legal representation, they're basically, over 62% of people cannot get a lawyer right now. Over 62% of the people, it's very hard for them to get a lawyer. And the number could be even higher in the rural areas as well. So, so we try as much as we can to keep up to date our resources. We can say, there's free lawyers where you're going, right? Because a lot of them, there, they have no resources. They take them a month, sometimes two months, just to just to get to this point, with basically just uh, you know certain very small necessities. And to the IWC, you know, provides so much for them here, but they have no money for legal resources. So we're trying to get our legal resources up to date and trying to give them legal representation because without that, uh, it's very hard for them to receive any kind of relief, especially asylum. So as you see, we've identified a lot of things that are really important about this project. And so moving forward, we know that there are a lot of areas of growth in terms of what do we do with this information moving forward? How can we connect more families to venues of support? And at the core of the work that we're doing is collaborating with others, right? And so we're very thankful for the relationship that we have established with the Interfaith Welcome Coalition. 
for everyone allowing us to be on the bus station and to provide the legal orientations to give this information to, to the families because we know that it is very useful for them. So thank you to all of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition volunteers um, and everyone that has been at the bus station and has been part of this work and of course everyone that continues to be part of this work in other capacities. Um, we also have a really good relationship with Greyhound staff and so we're really thankful for that as well. And of course moving forward we're really um, moving into a establishing national networks with our organizations across the U.S. Right now we have six partnerships um, in Los Angeles, Atlanta, Charlotte, Kansas City, Philadelphia, and L.A. So those are our six partnerships right now. So we've been able to refer families out to those partnerships directly and depending on the organization they offer different services. Sometimes it's only legal services, sometimes it's more mental health or just community services. And so we're, we're really working hard to make sure that we expand those networks so that one day we can connect all of the families that we're seeing at the bus station with someone that can support them when they arrive to their final destination. And of course, we couldn't do any of this work without the support of our volunteers that are there on a daily basis to, to make this work possible. When I talked about legal services, I'm just kind of, I want to give you just a quick notice. You know, having a lawyer makes it five times more likely uh, to win asylum. Five times more more likely. Uh, a lot of lawyers, unfortunately, in this area, they, they'll start at $5,000, you know, we are seeing numbers that are thrown out there. People cannot afford that. So we're trying to, these legal resources, our vision is to have 100% representation for these families. That is our goal. So, so what is our vision? Well, we talked about the resource guide uh, and about the legal representations for the families, but also court accompaniment. I think court accompaniment is so important to their ICE check-ins because if they miss that first one, they're basically, I'm not gonna say the word, they're basically screwed, I'm sorry, but that is the truth. People don't understand how important sometimes. When they leave the centers, and I spent the last year there, I just give them a packet and adios. It's basically people, some people, you know, a lot of them they cannot even read Spanish, and some of them don't speak Spanish. They have a different dialect from Guatemala, which is Cuanto, Guatemala, so many different languages. So it is our job to try to catch those errors, trying to let them know where they go. And it's very critical that we're there in support. So our mission is not just to be there during the day. We have a vision of also trying to move into nights as well. And, and we're going to do that very soon. And also on the weekends. Because there's a lot of need that on the weekends, we have buses that come at nights that it's very hard for them to have any kind of uh, uh, any kind of legal representation or any kind of orientation. So, so we're moving into that. Also, expanding our services, not just legal, but people get, have to see the doctor. So we're trying to expand our services for health services, for mental health services. A lot of them, they're psychologically scarred. We brought the psychologist to our center to do it, uh, uh, these families that have been separated for months, because they had their own psychologists at the center, so they found that they, these kids were not impacted at all. So we brought our own psychologist, there's an 89 year old psychologist, this Dr. Kleinman, he flew his own plane to the, to the centers. And he found, we have 16 families, he found that every single one of his children were psychologically scarred for life. That's what he found in his findings. There was not one day where he didn't leave crying talking to these children about their nightmares. So it's very important that we have mental health evaluations as well. So we are working with the psychologists as well and do it. See how we can find us, you know, racist and legal team is trying to find a lawsuit as well for what the Trump administration did to these families. Um, but also school. Families come in and they tell us, we have no right to school. That's what they tell us. And we tell them, you know, school is the great equalizer. It is what you know, it is what equalizes the rich and the poor. It opens up the doors to an opportunity for you and your family. So we try to tell them, so we're trying to find resources for school as well. How do you register your kids to school? And ultimately, we're doing this work for advocacy to shut those places down. This detention center should not exist. And that is our ultimate goal, is to shut them down. And that's all the information we have. If you have any questions, Yeah, we're gonna open it up for that. questions. Versus the psychologist that you brought in. Could you repeat that, please? Absolutely. 
They brought their own psychologists because we found that these people need a lot of psych evil. There was a lot of mental health. Who is The families that were at the detention center. We had over 700 families at the detention center. And I would say over 400 were re separated. They were separated twice from their children. So I was and the private prison system, we, we can talk about that. It's, 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 it's profit driven as we all know. And the product is human suffering. So these children have been affected. So we asked, racists asked to do psych psychological evaluations. So ICE brought in the Sun Psychiatrist and also Geo. Geo is the owner of this private prison systems that we have down there. So they brought their own psychiatrist and they found that there was no problem with these children. So we had to bring an independent psychologist, and he asked to talk to those psychologists in the centers, and he and they never he was there for two weeks waiting. They never met with him. He wanted to know where did you find these findings. I want to know your credentials because these kids are obviously traumatized for life. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I I know that they're occasionally they have been people from Rodeo Center that come to the airport. Well, I'm hoping that's part of your vision. <laughs> thank you for that. And that is part of our vision as well. I should have mentioned that. We are moving into the airports as well. So thank you for telling us. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't. i sure all of you here are, got an email saying that the Catholic World Services is working to set up uh, places like what we do here in the different cities uh, in the country. Is that, have, have you gotten that information? I've heard of it, but I haven't received yeah. an email from them. But I would be interested to getting in touch with them so that maybe we can collaborate. Because Denise Larock and I were on a, a little you know, video with them in front of the bus station, and they, they sent me the information. And it sounded like they were trying to set up these kinds, these kinds of uh, setups in the major cities of the United States. So I will, I will send you that. Okay, okay. that sure. would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yes. You know, as someone who has had the opportunity to work closely with um, Rhinosis at the bus station, I, I just really want to congratulate, especially Mariella, on this. I mean, you have two organizations with two different missions working side by side in the middle of what is just chaos and doing it very effectively and very respectfully, and we so deeply appreciate the work. Thank you. We're deeply honored to be part of that. There's only one more thing that I want to say. So we also have what, is, we have what is called a bond program. A lot of these families, and Pearsaw as well, one of the gentlemen mentioned Pearsaw, right now they're hosting bail for a lot of these families. And the average is $8,500, average. So Raiz is able to post his bonds for these families. And I don't have quite a number. I think Blake said over, do you remember the number he had? Yeah, he had over. We don't know how many times we help, but this is what's going on. It is totally ridiculous. We had one as high as $85,000 for a mother and a daughter. $85,000 for bail. It's totally ridiculous. So Davis is also paying that up front. Some folks are paying ICE, so we're trying to get that money back as well. So make sure they go to the court hearings mm -hmm. and everything. But it is it is very inhumane what is going on with our immigrant families from out of the board. Yeah. I, have, I have two other questions mm -hmm. before anybody goes. Okay, so to answer your first question, I don't, we don't have a point of contact in Sacramento, um, but I'm happy to look into that because we do have contacts in LA that maybe could help us make that connection, and so I'm happy to look into that. Can I further that question? We actually are moving an office to California. We're working on that right now, and it's going to happen, I'll say, over the next few months. We are having an office. This is going to be mostly our advocacy groups, a lot of media. So maybe you can, if you can find us information, we can maybe contact them. And for the second part? Oh yeah. What we do is we receive them directly, and those are the ones that have the least time, as IWC knows. 
Those are the ones that we have least time, but we try to catch as many as we can and try to give them a know your rights. And also their legal information, like the legal orientation, and also where to report. So we do try to catch as many as those as possible. Uh, no. No, no, we're not. Wouldn't that go past, no? They're coming, most of them are coming here. They're coming to our, to our station. So we do get buses on a daily basis from Eagle Pass. Yeah. And we do try to do the Know Your Rights as much as we can. Right. Yeah. And for those of you that have heard about the caravan that arrived to Piedras Negras, I don't know a lot about what's happening in terms of processing people, but I have heard from um, Casey Miller that used to be part of our bus station project. She's actually down there right now, and she's told me that the conditions in Piedras Negras are way worse than what they were in Tijuana, which is very alarming. Yes. Okay. I'm from Council on American Islamic Relations, and this is Casey. Let me you the microphone. Thank you. I'm, I run the chapter for the Council on American Islamic Relations in San Antonio, and this is a civil rights organization, the largest for the Muslims in the United States, headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, we do not specifically deal with immigration, but, of course, the Muslim cases that comes to us. My question to you is that you gave us the percentage of how many are coming from which country, but there are also a whole lot coming from the rest of the world. That's right. And do we have any percentage on that? You know, when I was at the center, uh, I did have people coming from, uh, from the Middle East, some people from the Middle East, some uh, Turkey, uh, Russia, Brazil, but here now, working here at the, at the, at the bus station, at the post-release, uh, we get very limited, very few. It's mostly from Central and South America that we're getting. I eventually do get Brazil as well. Uh, um, something about, but rarely do we run out receiving anybody from Brazil. Right. Yeah, um, I dealt with a few cases. Okay. Uh, well, as recent as four months ago, where people were coming from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh through Brazil mm -hmm. and all the way here crossing the borders and got caught. Yes. And uh, so once they are placed in a shelter, then I am called, you know. I want to pass on my information that if you have such cases, please call us. We can Absolutely. help you. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, it was so uh, heartbreaking to see that a, a family of six or seven, uh, three were released because with the mother, two were minors, and the mother was uh, severely diabetic. And the rest of them, 18-year-old daughter in, in, was in one detention center, the father was in another, and the, another son was in another. This is heartbreaking. So when we were told about it, that was the time she, the mother and the two kids were already placed in the shelter. And I was asked to raise the money for them because they want, did not want to live in the United States. They wanted to cross the borders to Canada and go to Canada, which they did. They were right away accepted over there. Fantastic. So this, this, this is it. I mean, I mean, if we know what you know in the beginning, you know, too bad we cannot help all the immigrants, but at least mm -hmm. one uh, community among them. I, I, I think collaboration and, and networking Definitely. is the key. Now, we do have a, a group in Raices. In fact, they work, they, they're right next, to my, right next to our office. Mm -hmm. And they're part of the Refugee and Resettlement Program. Okay. And our, our director is from Iraq. And our organizers from Afghanistan and mm -hmm. some from the Middle East. And they run this big program for Raices. Yeah. And they okay. take care of so many families. So if you let us know, we can definitely collaborate. I can give you my card. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I think it would be good to have you also explain the difference between the in case that there would be uh, people that she could refer to you also. Okay. So could you give your card also to Joe? Joe, stand up so she knows who you are. <laughs> the one in the yellow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to know um, how, um, how, how do you move the families uh, after they're, you get them out of the, uh, the detention centers? Where do they go? Do they have families here? Yes. Most people, what they do is, 
They cannot get out of detention centers unless they have a sponsor. And most sponsors, I would say like 7 to 8 percent are family members. The rest are friends, people who want to take them in. But most people are family members. Yes. I mean, just, just, to, give you, just to give you a sense, right now we have over 45,000 people incarcerated by ICE. 45,000 people. That's 5,000 people more than all of Canada being in, uh, people who are incarcerated in Canada. Just to give you that, 45,000, it is a big business. And it's a profit. That is the number one thing, profit. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. I, I, those of you who are around at the beginning know that things did not run as smoothly at the bus station as they do today. And I believe that Marissa and Sister Denise have a lot to do with that because of their kind attitudes. Um, we're going to have our committee, our different committee reports now, but I'm going to go through them quickly in case you know, we want to get through this part. So, Sister Pat, do you have anything? <coughs> Good morning. Um, we've changed our uh, advocacy committee meetings to 9 o'clock before this meeting, and it was much better. Probably because they're not so exhausted after the, uh, after our general meetings. Um, right now we're tracking. There's a lot of uh, evidence that we have the issues that we are concentrating on that are coming before our legislature, uh, or will, I should say, if we're going to be going to committee, et cetera. And so, as you know, we concentrate on the uh, immigration uh, issues, especially on immigrants, uh, those that are most vulnerable. And so we are, trans we are uh, tracking the uh, family detention centers, especially child detention, the situation with migrant workers and the changing issues here in the state of Texas that need to happen, and also DACA. So those are the four chief things that we are following presently. Um, we also looked at the lobby days coming up, but I'm just going to say them quickly and we'll try to get them out on our Facebook or website or MailChimp or whatever. The best thing for you to know. Um, Rita meets on, uh, is going to have a, a rally on lobbying day on March 17th, March 14th, I'm sure, sure. Yeah, that's the right date, in Catholic uh, Church on March 26th, Texas Impact on March 28th. So just mark, mark, mark out March as the month that you're going to go to Austin and just stay, okay? <laughs> we'll be sending out the bills as they, as you know, they're being submitted all the way to March 8th. And then the committees will decide what's going forward, et cetera. So we'll be sending that out again on a regular basis so that you can keep track of them. If you do not have an account on TLO, which costs nothing, which follows the Texas legislature, it's very, I think it's very visitor friendly. And you can put in issues like any of these four and find out where they are at that particular time. It's a remarkable site and free. How about that? Um, what we did today set up a committee of about seven to look at the different issues and the different, um, especially the different bills as they come up, to put together what our approach is as IWC. And then we will have and prepare people to give presentations to the three minutes is all we have at different committee meetings and at different parts of the uh, legislative process in order to make uh, known where we stand on these particular issues. And again, we're representing IWC, so we will be receiving more information. And if you have something you really object to, we'd be surprised, but we would consider it, okay? So any questions or anything from the group that I missed? Rebecca? I just want to add that I did find out where the uh, immigration lobby day is. Oh, good. And that is on February 25th. It's a Monday. Okay. So um, I'm sure you'll, you'll be getting uh, some kind of notice about whether you want to participate on that day. There's going to be groups from all over the state. Uh, so if you're, just put that on your calendar. February 25th, Monday, lobby day in Austin. Okay. And we'll give you as much information as we know about that, too. Anything else from the committee? Oh, great. So the, the next meeting again, 
come at 9 o'clock, join a wonderful group, and we'll move forward together. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to um, let you know that we have a new partner in storing um, supplies for the airport ministry, and that's Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, which is right out 281 at Winding Way, just near Bitters, between Bitters and Brook Hollow. And it's very handy for our airport volunteers when they have an emergency or run out of something. Um, we just heard that we have 200 families coming in today, and I have a feeling somebody's going to be out there getting additional supplies today. So, 200 from, from Dilly. Don't know about Carnes. Okay, I was looking at you, Terry, about collaboration, or is it Sister Sharon? I can't get him up here, Sister JT. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want to say something about collaboration? We've been working on this slide presentation for the uh, collaboration portion of our meeting. And I just want to emphasize that on the first slide that we'll show you, there's a, a URL. <clears throat> if you'll just write that down, you'll be able to come back to that later on, or if we make revisions. It's an address that we can put in to the computer and put tiny.cc forward slash IWC 2019 02. 02 is, uh, is for February. Is, so, is 2019 and 02 all together? They're all together. You'll see it when it comes up. I, I'm just trying to emphasize that, that this is a pattern that we may be able to do where the notes that were really important to us that we want to be able to come back to are going to be online They're immediately and they can be edited. We may be adding more information into this this presentation. So that's the collaboration part. Um, okay, nothing about fundraising. Uh, Sister Susan? Sister Susan Meek, I'm with the Benedictine Sisters at our monasteries in Bernie. And uh, our office puts together uh, this handout. So if you have it, if you could get it out. And if not, um, Ruben and Mina, could y'all, could you just raise your hand if you still need one? Okay, and y'all could y'all grab them and pass them out. Um, <clears throat> We kind of do a lot of the research and documentation of what's happening. And uh, so we put together various articles and forms and different things. The very first page, we try to document what's happening in those uh, detention centers. We participate in the family detention calls that are every two weeks. And as you can see, um, a couple of paragraphs down, um, when we were on the call this week, uh, 559 individuals were in Carnes, and Sister Denise estimated a little under 1,700 individuals detained in Dilly. So we just keep this as like an ongoing uh, running tab. Um, you've heard from other speakers how uh, you know people are released, etc. But we just keep trying to document what's being said, as well as how many people have been detained according to our government statistics and that type of thing. So if you need some of these for speeches or so, you can look in, in this. The rest of that handout is court cases that we continue to try to follow and document. And, um, and, and at the end there, uh, we did put in the government shutdown. We felt like that was very important because it had a profound effect on the you know many many things many people's lives but it also the immigration um, uh, the, and uh, hearings etc the next page is a lot of uh, opportunities uh, and you can use this in so many ways with your groups uh, when they say well what is it that we can do um, and we continually update that uh, thanks to the city of San Antonio, as well as those of you among us that uh, keep track of all the IWC events. And, um, and then we also, at the very end of that, try to put different websites so that if you're doing research, especially like TLU students, if you, you know, need resources, like those are some of the websites also that we check. And, um, you know, everything, we try to be fact-based. 
you know, this, I think that's really important for your research and anything that, um, that you put together. The next section is key articles. And so <clears throat> in here, we try to get especially ones that have statistics, again, for you to be able to use in your information. And that very first one, um, hope, you know, I mean, we know this, that so many children are being held, youth, um, 14,600, up approximately nine, uh, from 9,200 when President Trump took office two years ago, et cetera. And then the very last thing there in that article, we highlighted temporary shelters bill the government about $750 per child per day, while permanent shelters charge $250. Both seem exorbitant. <laughs> So, uh, you know, when we're looking for money for things in our budget, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, and then um, this just happened this week where uh, this whole thing about in McAllen, Catholic Charities has been ordered to um, vacate the Immigrant uh, Respite Center. And then there was a, a second article about the mayor uh, saying that, I think it was the commissioners um, there in McAllen that said that, and the mayor then pledged the next day in his uh, State of the City uh, speech that he was going to help find a new home. So that was a bit hopeful in that sense. So we, we documented both of those things there. The next articles, um, we're just documenting the closure of Tornillo, the tent city outside, outside of El Paso. And, uh, you know, kind of some of that relates right back to those statistics that we were just talking about, about how many children were held there and how much money was made off of those children, et cetera. Um, and then we just put in this article, <clears throat> we didn't know whether this was going to become a big deal this week or not, about the immigration detention beds became a new issue in this whole uh, fight over keeping our government open. So it, the, um, this did not materialize in, in any significant way uh, in what is being proposed, and we still don't know whether today it's going to be passed or you know we'll have a government shutdown. But uh, anyway, so... <clears throat> And um, then you may have heard this in the El Paso Detention Center, um, some of the uh, asylum seekers that, were, that are on a hunger strike are being force fed. And so that was ordered by a federal judge that that was going to be okay. And so there's questions of whether or not that is against uh, the UN Convention Against Torture. So we wanted to document that that's going on. When you ever think, oh, like, why are judges so important? Why is this whole system so important? I mean, right here, you see it affecting people's lives when one judge has the power to order this force feeding. So, <clears throat> and then we just have another uh, article in here about like forced labor in detention. It goes with everything everybody said already about making money off people that are in those detention centers and how little is paid if they're in a work program. Um, the border crossings, I mean, so much is happening there. We just put in several articles uh, on the day that our president was giving his speech in El Paso. More than 1,800 Central American parents and children crossed the border that day into El Paso area. That was the most recorded in a single day by the U.S. Customs and Border uh, Protection. So, I mean, these numbers are, you know, so big in that sense. But again, just to try to keep um, <clears throat> documenting all of this. And then the second article, so many people are going to more remote areas of, of the desert, and it's just so much harder to have resources or find resources. So we just wanted to uh, document that, and that next article also talks about that in the Arizona desert. Um, and then we just documented some other things about uh, the caravans in, in Tijuana and um, California approving funding to help asylum seekers. Um, the next couple of articles are about our government shutdown and how it impacted the immigration system because so many of those were, cl uh, the courts were closed. And so you see the numbers there. Um, Oh, I mean, you just can't even imagine. Uh, 42,726 scheduled hearings had been canceled. And for each week, the, you know, each week, 
was about 20,000 canceled hearings. So, I mean, this, <laughs> this is huge. These are just huge, huge numbers. And um, then to try to get back up and running, and it, it just documented our own area here of San Antonio saying that we had like five immigration judges and that there are about 350 judges in 58 immigration courts across the country. You remember early on in this whole situation they were talking about we need a thousand more judges. So, you know, that's not in the mix either at this point uh, in our budget. But I mean, these are the kinds of things. And, you know, I, I would appreciate too if you hear of anyone, uh, like a colleague of mine, her daughter works in the, that federal system as a prosecutor, and she was telling me all of the things that they went through, you know, having to report to work even though they weren't being paid and then also having to take time off and then they lost any vacation or any things that were scheduled during that particular time. And then as the shutdown dragged on, they were expected still to be there all the working hours, no matter what, and um, also to basically work possibly a whole week for free. So, you know, these are really, I don't know if anybody will go on the record with that, but, you know, I mean, these are things that are actually happening that, you know, in that whole system. So, um, and then we just were documenting about New Mexico withdrawing their National Guard troops and stuff. And then the, some of the lawsuits, um, Honduran Nepali immigrants uh, sued to block the Trump administration keep, to keep their temporary protected status. Um, this was just the other day, the Butterfly Refuge uh, in uh, the Brownsville area, they're filing a restraining order against our um, federal government to stop the wall construction in, the, in that area. And many of you know, I mean, that area is very famous for the butterflies and the birding. There's so many birders that go there to be part of these areas. And so the wall would just put, you know, a whole stop to some of this that's happening. And then on the other call, we heard from the American Immigration Council. They sent a letter to Secretary Nielsen to end immigrant protection protocols policy. So that was a link to that. The, on the last two pages, we put in this article, uh, some of you may have seen it, it was in the San Antonio paper, Roger Barnes is with Incarnate Word, and he wrote this along with another person, um, Dennis Slattery, and it talks about you know where population will be, and they're quoting this study from the Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service in the, at the University of Virginia that by 2040, the um, half of the nation's population will live in just eight states. So we highlighted those eight states. We are one of those eight states. And they're raising the implications of our federal government uh, governing in a way. They're saying like, okay, for instance, those eight states will have 16 senators. So there'll be 84 senators representing what, you know, so many other states, but not people. And so, you know, what are the implications of this? And I think it's just part of, in, in today's paper, there's an article also, I didn't realize this, that there were four lawsuits, you know, around the electoral college and this type of thing. So it's just like to raise our awareness, like what's going on with some of that, and then, you know, go forward. And this morning, I saw another thing from ABC News, lawyers sue ICE over video conference immigration hearings. We've been talking about this here, it seems like forever, where uh, you know people can't hear on the video conferencing or they don't understand the language or it's not clear or garbled, et cetera. So all of that's going on. And Sister Pat, can I just ask you to come up and say what you heard on NPR yesterday, because I think that was really important too. You know, as soon as we publish anything, it's old, but <laughs> you know, so she heard this yesterday on NPR. Just something to follow about the children's attention. I think it's, uh, gosh, Homeland. Is that Homestead. Thank you. Homestead. Um, Homestead over in Florida that is a detention center for unaccompanied youth. And what um, was reported, and it's run by a for profit, but it's on federal land. And therefore, the state laws with regard to children, children being held, does not apply. And the last part of it really concerned me, it said, 
and they're establishing three more such centers in Texas. My intuition would say probably on federal lands. So we need to watch that carefully if we're watching out for our kids for the future. Okay. Thank you. And I just wanted to announce also that our sisters gave permission for us to purchase shares in uh, the GEO group and Core Civic. I've been attending those uh, share, uh, the, you know, when the shareholders meet with those groups. <laughs> So as I reported to you a couple of meetings ago, and, and Sister JT's, uh, the Daughters of Charity also bought shares. The Jesuits uh, nationally are the ones leading some of those um, uh, dialogues, and like Core Civic is working on a human rights policy, so we're waiting for that to be published, and then we can critique it and uh, you know talk to them more about that. And at the last meeting with Core Civic, as I reported to you, um, I knew more about Dilly than the person that they sent to talk about it, and he was quite surprised, and I just gently kept correcting him with what he was saying because it was not right. So. I think that there's no way we can ever thank Sister Susan and Ruben for what they do for us every month. And I have learned so much from her over the years uh, as a nonprofit person, as a person who, you know, paid attention. Our, my thought was that if someone was doing something bad, you pulled your stock out. And I learned from her is that's when you buy more so that you'll have more influence. And it was such a revolutionary thought for me. <laughs> Um, okay, so we don't have a sanctuary update because Moon is with uh, one of our folks uh, that's getting her ankle monitor checked today, so she did that. Um, Sister Denise is at the bus station because of you know what's happening with the bus station right now, so Good Jan is going to make a report at the bus station. Okay. Yeah, Sister Denise really regrets she can't be here, but as you heard, there's 200 releases just coming from Dilly, so she needed to be there. So she asked me to just address just two items briefly. Um, just the, um, the numbers that we've been seeing, I mean, they really decreased dramatically in January, and now that they are increasing dramatically in the other direction. So I figured the best way to communicate that was to give you a summary. So in the last two weeks, from the 1st of February, and this is per backpacks, which is, which, is, which is our best way of keeping track of numbers. We've handed out 832 backpacks and just in the last two weeks. Just the bus station. And that's like family. Yeah, per family. Um, because it's not just Dillian Carnes anymore, so we just can't go by the numbers that we're receiving of releases. And that's an average of a low of 38 to a high of, of 92. And, you know, it's an average of 64 a day. And, you know, that average is going to be blown today because we have 200 coming. And with the census in Dilly at 1,700, I think we can anticipate that that is going to continue. Um, so the other thing she wanted me to mention um, is we're working on a memorandum of understanding with Corporate Greyhound. And... Um, um, how can I put this? There were some groups volunteering in Dallas and Houston that had a, a less than optimal relationship with Greyhound and were, dis <laughs> and were disinvited um, uh, to be at the bus station. Now, we are the role model uh, for a volunteer group as far as Greyhound is concerned. So they asked us to um, formalize our relationship with them and to create policies and procedures and also guidelines for successful collaboration with Greyhound, which, which we have done. And thanks to Tino Gallegos, he put us in, 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 in touch with a law firm in Houston, and they have taken our policies and procedures and our guidelines, and they have uh, put them into a memorandum of understanding. And um, the reason that that is of value is because, I mean, it's, it's legally non-binding, but it formalizes our relationship. And it sets out what, um, uh, you know, ex expectations are of each organization, Greyhound and us. So um, right now, um, you know, and thanks to Sister Denise, our relationship with our general manager is amazing, and also with, with Corporate Greyhound. 
um, she was invited on a, a, a conference call and they basically defined what is important to them among the groups that they let into their bus station. And so that's all part of our policies and procedures. Now, Robert had a major heart attack a couple months ago, and he's back now, and he's gonna retire in a year. So our relationship with Greyhound cannot be based on one individual. So the fact that we have formalized it with corporate Greyhound really protects our, um, our position at the bus station. So we're just doing some last minute modifications to that, and, and uh, the attorneys who have just been amazingly helpful are going to um, finish it, and we're going to present it to, um, uh, to Greyhound. So um, uh, Sister Denise wanted you all to be aware that, you know, that that's a work in progress. Yeah. And so, Sharon, what? Tell about last night. Oh, last night. Um, the mayor's office, you know, um, uh, San Antonio is an official compassionate city. They signed the Charter for Compassion. And so Mayor Nuremberg established um, the, the Mayor's Compassionate San Antonio Award. And when they asked for nominees, you know, of course we nominated Sister Denise. And she was one of, of nine really amazing people who were honored last night at City Council Chambers. And so um, I'm the one who nominated her, and she will never forgive me for that. Okay? <laughs> She's the most humble person in the world, and she hates to be the center of attention. So we embarrassed her as much as we possibly could <laughs> last night. So, um, yeah, so if you're on Facebook, you know, we posted pictures on Facebook, and then we took her out to dinner afterwards and continued to embarrass her. So yeah, it was, it was, a, great, it was a great event. Uh, are you sure that's okay? <laughs> okay, no, she won't. She, I told her last night, jokingly, I said, you know, I'll, I'll be your agent, okay, but of course that will be a salaried position. Um, there is, and the, the fact I'm hesitant because I don't know the details, there is um, a, a na na national, Im yeah, say that again, National Immigration Policy Institute, and they are having um, a seminar, and she's been invited to sit on a panel, um, which is their national meeting. Mm -hmm. you be doing this. And then, um, uh, and she just told me last night that she's been invited to present at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, of course, it's some immigration-related panel. So, you know, I said, well, that's great because when she's gone, you know, I have. So, so if you could spread these out a little bit, you know, that would be greatly appreciated. But she really is becoming a very um, nationally known, respected figure. She would be horrified right now if she I know, could be hear sure us. I this in a minute. <laughs> yeah, but she's not here. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so we are really uh, very honored. She truly will be upset about this. <laughs> we do need to get in a minute so she has to read this. <laughs> okay, uh, so the next report. Oh, John. I'll do the hospitality really fast. Okay. Um, but first, I just want to note how what a gift it is to have Jan here with us. Yeah. And, and it just reiterates how many people are doing this work from a place of woundedness. And we continue to, to, to serve. But it's it's really inspirational to see her here and, and, and speaking this way after this really, really trying week. I would like to note that Joe back there has been doing this incredible coordination of overnight hospitality. So over the last month or since our last meeting, it's been about 70 families overnight. But even in the midst of all that coordination with um, our house at the Mennonite uh, Church, and the uh, Catholic Charities Department and, and private homes. In the midst of that, she also went down to Piedras Negras. Yeah. And if you haven't seen her email and her photographs, um, they are fabulous, but she walked across the bridge with her dog, Patches, and she went and visited um, the, one of the shelters where, where this caravan is massing and had conversations with uh, folks through the fence and with the guards. Um, and so she was sort of our ambassador, but then also brought back this really uh, important uh, information. Um, so if you haven't seen that email with her photographs, reach out to Joe Pendleton. 
Then the I also want to make an advertisement for next Thursday at seven o'clock, and then next Saturday at one o'clock at the Mennonite Church. Um, we're going to have this. Sister Denise calls it "Do No Harm" uh, training, and it's essentially a trauma-informed training around this type of volunteer work. And I will be co-facilitating it with one of the women who's come up from Honduras and is seeking asylum. So you can have, you know, have the white guy's perspective, and you can have the woman who's been through these experiences uh, perspective. But it's amazing how we can show up to the bus station. Uh, to pick someone up for overnight hospitality and because we've done something wrong or we weren't thinking about this one certain thing we are re-traumatizing them and they will refuse to go with us so over the last number of years we've learned a bunch of things to avoid and some specific techniques and, and, a, and a toolbox uh, to use when you're at the bus station or the airport or in your own home or in the shelter so we're going to be talking about that body language, the words that you say, um, the things that you do, and also actual physical props. Um, then so many of these uh, families are evangelical Christians. So how do you pray with an evangelical Christian who's in a, who's in a um, traumatizing uh, or is in like a really really difficult place? So we'll we'll talk about all of those things, and it'll be it'll be very interactive. Um, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for saving me because you're not on the agenda yet again. You're supposed to be. Okay, so the next person to speak is Mary, Mary Grace Kettner. Uh, she is speaking for the uh, airport group. I can just say that we've since our last IWC meeting, we've given out 783 uh, backpacks at the airport, and I didn't divide them by weeks, but the majority of those were in the last two weeks. January, like the bus station was low, and then we're high again the last couple of weeks. Okay, Jane, did you do what we agreed on? Yes, those are the backpack numbers, if you can see them. Okay, just leave them up there while we proceed in that way, everybody can see the, the backpacks. Um, okay, so uh, we're now ready for our reports from the collaborators. Uh, did anybody bring a card to you? Uh, yes. Okay, those of our collaborators who have uh, something to tell us, announce, please come forward and I'll leave the microphone here. I mentioned before, and I'm sorry for my lack of technicality, the Chinese CC IWC 2019 02. If you type that in, it's going to get this slide presentation, which is going to have the notes that we're presenting. We're asking our presenters to give us a, a slide, a, a card that's going to have this information. Maybe about 90 seconds to present. One of the people that was going to be here uh, is from St. Mary's. And she wanted to announce, she has to be in Austin today, but she wanted to announce that Thursday, February 21st, there's going to be a pre-symposium presentation at St. Mary's. This information is going to be on this slide and you can find it later on. Uh, but the symposium, and Tino, did you want to talk about that a little bit? Or? Sure, I thought so. Yeah, so uh, every year the, the scholar, which is one of the law review uh, student-run law reviews at St. Mary's Law School host a symposium um, on uh, on immigration. So this year's event is going to be held on uh, February 22nd. It's at the Pearl Stable all day, basically. Um, it's one of these kind of events that has training for lawyers, but also really good information for the public. The keynote speakers are not our Reynolds, who work with Amnesty International's um, refugee steering or refugee uh, steering committee uh, for the United States for many years. And she's an internationally known um, refugee rights lawyer and human rights lawyer. And so she's going to be speaking both on the Friday at the event, but also in a free event at St. Mary's Law School on their campus on uh, Thursday. That's from 3 to 5. Uh, our partner, Fred Schellenberg, asked me to be, he couldn't be here today, but he 
ask that we uh, continue to announce that they're going to have a citizenship naturalization workshop February 23rd. And so this slide will give that information. He sent along a, a slide and just a, a note that if you send these to us early on or to me, um, we can try to get them on the slide presentation in this form. And Tom, I'm going to let you be the next. Thanks, Terry. I'm Tom Hager, still a mostly retired Presbyterian pastor, back again. A month ago, I said, help the group of four from the state of Maine that were coming in mid-March became a group of 20. Um, Travis Park United Methodist Church stood up. Cots, a kitchen, showers, accommodations are taken care of. Now I need your help in filling out the two-part four days. They'll be here. They arrive Saturday, the 16th of March. That's my wedding anniversary, I better remember. And they leave Wednesday morning, the 20th. So we have four nights and three full days to number one, provide some hands-on direct experience. And number two, provide some advocacy resourcing so that they can go home and kick butt in the state of Maine. Um, a number of you, Janice and Jane and John and others have already begun to say, I'll help with this, I'll do that. Uh, Charlotte Ann is going to do an intro. Elena Yala is going to do a workshop. If you've got resources that would be helpful for this intensive care, uh, three or four days, please chat with me today or follow up. Um, there's um, information all over the place. Let me thank you with a strange quote, if I can manage a mic in my phone and be brief. Um, Howard Thurman black pastor, prophet, poet, mentor of Dr. King's, flips the usual motivation for the work that you're doing and says this, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive, and then just go do it. Because what the world most needs is people who have come alive. Yes. Thank you, people. My name is Rebecca Cotis and I am reporting for SA Stands. I'm a member of that, as IWC is, and many different organizations are. I think we have a total of 26 organizations who are members of SA Stands. This is a collaborative, and we have been working on site and release with the city of San Antonio. Uh, that means that for some um, minor misdemeanors, people will, will be given a ticket and be sent on their way instead of being processed and, with, as, uh, and arrested. And so this program, which has been approved, um, and uh, I guess Chief McManus spoke about it yesterday, will start April, tw April, this April 2019, and it will be for the City of San Antonio Police Department. Um, the future steps that SA Sense has to uh, begin is to start training people, training people, the, the community, about what this means and what, how it's going to um, work, how it's going to be implemented. And so we're trying to find um, um, groups that are willing to get trained on it. So if any of you have access to groups who might be interested in this, and it's not only for immigrants, but it's, it, it really is for everybody. Immigrants just have the huge fear of being deported if they are stopped and arrested. Um, there will be reports, we have asked for transparency, so they will, they will be giving us reports uh, every six months and then annually. So we will know if what this site and release is, all, is being implemented, what's uh, coming of it. We're still working on making library cards as one of the IDs that are acceptable by the city of San Antonio. When you are stopped and you don't have any other ID, will, will a library I, a card be acceptable? And so uh, we're, that's still in the in the process of being worked out. Um, this Saturday, uh, we still have a, the issue with the county. You know, we just worked with the city. So now we're gonna start working on the county. And so this Saturday, we're meeting at the uh, San Antonio's AFL-CIO offices uh, at 10, from 10 to 12, and we're gonna work out our steps to uh, propose to the county, because they do have the county jails. 
And, um, and so if any of you are interested, you may come. Uh, it's at 9502 Computer Drive, room 102, this Saturday from 10 to 12. Thank you. Hello, this is Sumaira Egg from Rainbow Foundation. Uh, so I, I, I'm also with the action team with the immigration. Uh, so as Rainbow, uh, we contacted before to with Sister Denise and we asked for my... Rather than have it below the chair. Okay. Here? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, I have it lower. Sorry. Okay, and as a community center, um, we have volunteers that can do art for the refugees and immigrants. And uh, like our friends, she, she can do it because we always heard about like all this trauma, you know, all, it, it can be many things that I think we also, as a community center, what our strengths are, we can cook and invite and kind of have a, a we, we have a diverse community, so we can, we always invite our, invite our events, local, American, Mexican, or even all nations. We have, uh, so we, we want to do things like that because we, we believe that even, seeing the diversity in the city uh, help the newcomers too. This, this is what we did as a Turk, uh, someone, immigrant from Turkey. So we want to do that. So I think now I know uh, the contact, maybe I'll ask Lena again uh, uh, with the collaboration. So we can either have our friend uh, that she can go and do art with the kids or anyone else. Uh, it's a water marvel art, which is known as the uh, for trauma, you know, it's about um, meditation or kind of thing. So we'll do that. And also, uh, I want, <laughs> we are late again. I think the mayor was fast enough to give the award to Sister Denise and IWC. But we have an upcoming uh, annual uh, event. Uh, then, uh, we, it is uh, annual dialogue and friendship dinner. Every year we do this and uh, this will be 14th. Uh, and this year, uh, the opening prayer will be done by uh, Archbishop um, Gustavo Garcia Siller. And also, every year we kind of highlight or recognize nonprofits who are very, you know, helping the community, service, education, uh, communication, etc. And we, two years ago, it was Reyeses. And this year, uh, I, we, we want to give it to IWC, Interfaith Welcome Coalition. And hopefully, so, um, if you accept <laughs> so uh, we want to highlight this and we are really working on this, you know, uh, to get the word out. So we believe that this will, you know, it's not a, you know, dry word, but hopefully it will uh, have some papers in the newspapers so we can have a voice over there. So, and we usually have attendance of 250 and 300 and interfaith, intercultural community. So we are looking for, and I have uh, flyers of that event and uh, we'll be in contact. Um, with IWC, I don't know, like uh, Sister Denise and yeah. What's the date? Uh, March 4th, Monday, uh, Rosenberg Sky, like uh, your University of the Incarnate World. And uh, it's the, I have flyers, but uh, so we, we will ask, of course, more about, and usually uh, when the award is given by the person, and hopefully this will be, this, this, this will be the service award. So uh, Archbishop, probably uh, will give this award and then uh, Sister Denise or whoever from IWC uh, will have a time to talk like a couple of minutes or two, three minutes, I'm not sure, because we have another keynote speaker. In fact, the event is like about free press and democracy and exile editor's view. So the speaker, keynote speaker is, uh, uh, was the former editor-in-chief of Turkish newspaper before it was shut down. He's, he's an exile now, uh, he's doing Uber. Now, and he's the speaker. So, yeah, we want IWC to be, IWC to be highlighted there, recognized, and hopefully. So, this is the thing. Yeah. Thank you. March 4th, uh, 6 p.m., it's a dinner, annual dialogue and friendship dinner. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave the, uh, yeah, I can, I can leave the flyers if you want. Yeah, thanks a lot. And Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll give you those flyers and we'll add that into our presentation. Sure. Yes. Okay. So um, this is Tim Rodriguez. I'm the immigration liaison. 
I'm filling in for Ann Humpke, who's our faith based liaison for the city of San Antonio. She wanted me to announce the quarterly meeting for the working group and action teams that will be taking place on Tuesday, February the 26th from 1.30 to 3.30 at the Downtown Library Auditorium. Um, if you want any further information, you can feel free to contact Ann directly, but I think a lot of people who are here uh, are actively participating in the, in the working groups and action teams uh, with the faith-based initiative. So uh, this is just a reminder of the meeting, and um, one of the things that she wanted me to stress to you is that they're looking for some volunteers to, to serve uh, on a couple of different committees, one of them for the Trauma-Informed Care Coalition, and another for the Census Complete Count Committee that the city is putting together to ensure that um, we get a full count of all of San Antonio residents during the 2020 Census. Two more slides that were here. Uh, we talked about the trauma-informed uh, presentations. Here's a slide that's going to show you the time and place again. Domesticus Unitas has a special screening of the Oscar-nominated film Roma, February 24th at 5 p.m. at the Bijou Bijou. Um, American Gateways has a citizenship workshop March 9th from 9 to 2 p.m. And this shows that information. That's it. Thank you. And all, all this information, information again, will be on the URL site. So go there and uh, get the information. You know, the URL, the... the Tiny CC. The uh, link that he gave us. Make it up, please. Yeah. yeah. And read it for those of us with bad eyes. <laughs> okay. Tiny.cc slash IWC 201902. Thank you. Okay, are there any other announcements that we have failed to mention? Okay, um, I want to, I mean, I, I think you can see as you hear the reports, the many different committed people that do their job, and it all comes together to do this ministry. And uh, I, I, I think I speak for Mary Grace as well. We are extremely grateful for everything each of you do each month to help others. And thank you for being here, and we hope to see you next month. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh, and, uh,